Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to New York University, Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimò. My name is Stefano Albertini. I'm the director. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the second event of our series, Recitar Cantando. And uh, as you know, it's a series that we dedicated to conversations on Italian music and literature. Some of you were here for the previous event, and I think it's a formula that really worked. Uh, so it's a presentation of scholars that talk about the assign topic uh, with live performance uh, by young artists from the Isma School of Music. Um, this is the second event. Uh, Elena Bellina, who is the curator of this series, is going to tell you something more precise about uh, this evening. I think actually the, the, the title we picked, The Freak and the Superstar, the Castrati in the Italian music tradition, is pretty brilliant. I claim no credit for it. It's all uh, the making of Julian Sack, so uh, I'm not uh, praising myself. Um, so Elena is going to tell us something about the structure of this evening. She's going to introduce our panel, uh, both the scholars and the artists, and then she's going to tell you uh, about our next and last event for the series, for the season, that is going to be a presentation of the opera Il Trionfo dell'Onore that, as you might know, will be performing in full form here at Casa Italiana in May. Without further ado, I would like to take this opportunity also to greet the people that are following us uh, through the live broadcast in HD that we are offering, and uh, I wish all of you a wonderful evening. Thank you. Welcome again to the second event, uh, to the Castrati Night. And tonight we have quite a few people on the stage, so just to uh, explain how things are going to take place and then I'll introduce the speakers. First of all, we have uh, three music moments. Uh, so the event will start with um, a singer uh, and, the, and, uh, and they are accompanied by a pianist. Then the first speaker, then another singer, the second speaker, then another singer, and then the three speakers will be on stage taking questions, discussing, and um, talking about their presentations. And at that point, we'll take Q and A's, uh, questions from the audience. And uh, tonight we have Roger Freitas, who's associate professor uh, and chair of musicology at the Eastman School of Music at the University of Rochester, where he has taught since uh, receiving his PhD from Yale University in 1998. He has published articles on Italian cantata, the gender status of the castrato, and issues of performance practice in both the 18th and 19th centuries, and his book, Portrait of a Castrato, Politics, Patronage, and Music in the Life of Atto Melani, uh, won the uh, Philip Brett Award for the LGBTQ Study Group by the American uh, Musicological Society. Roger, so you become visible if you want to stand. So this is Roger Freitas, for those of you who are not familiar with Roger. Then we'll have uh, Emily Wilburn, who's Assistant Professor of Musicology at Queens College and at the Graduate Center at uh, CUNY. Uh, she graduated from uh, NYU with a PhD in musicology in 2008, and then she was a Mellon postdoctoral fellow uh, at, uh, in music at Columbia University. Uh, she's, she published uh, many articles on the Commedia dell'arte and 17th century music, and she's currently working on a book manuscript entitled 17th Century Opera and the Legacy of the Commedia dell'arte. In 2011, uh, she was awarded a Philip Brett Award for Excellence in Queer Music Scholarship. Emily, please. So. <laughs> And uh, the panel will be moderated by Susan Kuzik, who is Professor of Music on the Faculty of Arts and Science at NYU. She has published extensively on gender and sexuality in relation to the musical cultures in early modern Italy and in contemporary North America. Uh, her book, Francesca Caccini at the Medici Court, Music uh, and the Circulation of Power, 2009, received the Best Book Award from uh, the 2007 Society of the Study of Early Modern Women. And most recently, uh, she has studied the use of sound in detention and in interrogation in prisoners of prisoners held during the 21st century war on terror. 
And right now, uh, she's working on a book project for which she was awarded an ACLS fellowship for next year that explores the relationship among the, among the erotic, the sonic, and the political in early modern Florence through a retelling of one of the city's most notorious sex and singing nun scandals. That should be very, very uh, interesting. And this is Professor Susan Kuzic. And for the, the singer, we have three students from the Eastman School of Music. Um, uh, we have Anthony Baron, who is a second year master's student at the Eastman School of Music, uh, who received um, at Westminster uh, Choir College the prestigious President's Award and recently won the Music Teacher National Association Young Artist Voice Competition, uh, who will be singing La Chamor from Orlando by Endel. And then, uh, Anthony, so you become. <laughs> Tracy Chang, who is a, a, a second year master's student at Eastman of music, originally from Taiwan, and uh, who will be starting her DMA here at the Graduate Center CUNY starting from the fall semester. <laughs> <laughs> And Paulina Zvierczak, uh, who's a junior student at the Eastman School of Music, originally from Toronto. So, uh, Paulina. And we. We start the night with uh, Roberto Scarcella Perina uh, accompanying um, uh, Tracy Chang, who will be singing Verdi Piante from Orlando by Handel. Thank you.
Okay, that's impossible to follow. Um, right, okay. Am I up and running in the back there? Okay, great. That was, as you know, Verdi Piante from Act Three of Handel's Orlando, an opera based at several orders of remove on Ludovico Ariosto's 16th century epic Orlando Furioso. In the aria, the leading lady, Angelica, bids farewell to the woodlands where she fell in love with Medoro and where she also hid from Orlando, another man who very much wants her. The argumento of this opera makes clear that, as in so many works, love is indeed the primary subject. In this case, especially its dangers. Let's see, did it work? It worked. This is from the Argumento. The immoderate passion that Orlando entertained for Angelica, Queen of Cathay, and which in the end totally deprived him of reason, is an event taken from Ariosto's incomparable poem. The additional fiction of the shepherdess Dorinda's love for Medoro, Dorinda was an added character, and the constant zeal of the magician Zoroaster, who sort of takes over Astolfo's role from the poem, for the glory of Orlando tends to demonstrate the imperious manner in which love insinuates its impressions into the hearts of persons of all ranks, and likewise how a wise man should be ever ready with his best endeavors to reconduct in the right way those who have been misguided from it by the illusion of their passions. Here, love is an illusion, an immoderate passion, ultimately a madness, and the wise man who understands this helps others to see it, helps them quite literally in this opera to regain their reason. 
Oops, sorry. And goodbye. This point, strangely enough, leads us right to the question of what castrati are doing in Baroque opera. As you may already know, the male leads of these operas, the characters most under the spell of love, were regularly portrayed by castrato singers, or sometimes women. In the 20th century, opera directors and opera goers used to fret about the seemingly perverse practice of casting all the great heroes of myth and history with castrated men and their treble voices. For that reason, it was common in the first half of the 20th century to transpose these roles down an octave. Happily, this practice ceased some time ago, primarily for musical reasons, and now we usually hear countertenors or women in these parts. If we still experience any, any gender dissonance at the sound of high-voiced Alexanders and Julius Caesars, or Orlandos and Medoros, most writers on opera tell us we should ignore it. As Dorothy Kaiser puts it, the practice of cross-sexual casting, as seen in the Italian Baroque opera, assumes that the audience will not be disturbed by contradictions between the sexual identity of the character being portrayed and either the actual gender of the performer or the voice register of the musical part. This evening, I will try to explain why I think this reasoning is misguided. Indeed, my work on the castrato has convinced me that these singers played amorous leading roles not in spite of their physical distinctiveness, but because of it. Or, to put it another way, as much as the taste for castrato singing may have pr produced emasculated leading men, so also did the taste for emasculated leading men bolster the tradition of castrato singing. Before launching into my material, I should just say that for time's sake, I'm focusing on just this one aspect of castrato existence in the 17th and 18th centuries, um, although I could certainly talk about other things if you want to ask questions later in the discussion. In his 1702 comparison of French and Italian music, Francois Ragunet writes, these castrato voices, sweet as nightingales, are enchanting in the mouths of actors portraying the part of a lover. Nothing is more touching than the expression of their pains uttered with that timbre of voice so tender and impassioned. And the Italians have in this a great advantage over the lovers in our French theaters, whose voices, heavy and virile, are consistently much less suitable to the sweet words that they address to their mistresses. Essentially, Raguinet is suggesting that a castrated man is better suited to representing a lover than an intact one. A key to comprehending such an alien sensibility may be found in the conception of sexuality that characterized the early modern period. For this background, I am indebted primarily to the historian Thomas Lecoeur, whose groundbreaking research has traced the discontinuities in sexual attitudes between the early modern and post-enlightenment period. He suggests that the most funda fundamental and radically unfamiliar element of the earlier viewpoint is its premise of a one-sex system. That is to say, instead of explaining male and female bodies as the two distinct forms of the human species, the early modern tradition considered man to be the more perfect manifestation of the single body that both men and women shared. The differences between the sexes lay not in the flesh itself, but in the higher phenomenon of vital heat. This insensible but fundamental energy of life not only determined the development of sexual organs in the womb, but also influenced the balance of humors throughout life, and thus all aspects of a person's health, character, and intelligence. Rather than viewing the sexes as distinct and opposite then, the one sex model posited a hierarchical continuum ranging from man down to woman, with a theoretically infinite number of intermediate gradations. Many of these gradations were in fact far from theoretical, the most familiar transitional figure being the prepubescent child. Although in the womb, the difference in vital heat between boys and girls was considered great enough to determine genital formation, a man's full heat was not thought to develop until adolescence, when male and female bodies began to differentiate themselves. Castrating a boy before puberty, then, did not throw his sex, in the modern sense, into question. It merely froze him within the middle ground of the hierarchy of sex. He never experienced the final burst of vital heat that would have taken him to full masculinity. Sexually speaking, the castrato was equivalent to the boy. 
In fact, he was an arrested boy. Although his body would increase in size, his surgery ensured that his physical characteristics would remain at the less markedly masculine levels of youth. For this reason, contemporaries often labeled both castrati and young boys as effeminate, a key concept here. Whereas today, describing a man as effeminate might imply homosexual leanings, the term in the 17th century indicated a man with too great a taste for women. Indeed, drawing on many examples, scholars Anne Jones and Peter Stallybrass have concluded that in this period, quote, it is heterosexuality itself which is effeminating for men. Such an outlook depends, of course, on the pre-enlightenment belief in an unbroken continuity between one's physical and behavioral aspects. The vital heat and humors of one's body determine not only outward appearance, including genital sex, but also personality. Conversely, this vital heat could itself be affected either by physical intervention in the form of bleeding, medication, or indeed childhood castration, or by conduct, consorting with or behaving like people whose vital heat differed from one's own. Such instability provoked real anxiety. A man who succumbed too much to the pleasures of the flesh, whose existence revolved too much around women, was considered in danger of losing his masculine nature and even physical strength. By the same principle, a man who presented a rather feminine demeanor, like a boy or castrato, seemed predisposed to becoming ensnared in what was considered the womanish pursuit of love. This sketch of the early modern sexual order, and particularly the erotically charged station of the boy, finds support and enrichment in a range of contemporary literature and art. For example, in the first canto of Giambattista Marino's influential La Donne from 1623, the poet describes his hero in a passage worth quoting at some length. Adonis was then at the age which feels the spark of love most vigorous and keen, and he was disposed to face the new bitterness ill-timed to his years. Nor on the roses of his lovely cheeks had yet blossomed any bud of gold, or if any shadow of hair had begun to show, it seemed like a flower in the field or a star in heaven. In blonde ringlets of pure shining gold, his hair writhed and curled, under which there flowed the white line of his ample forehead in smiling majesty. A sweet vermilion, a sweet burning flame, mingled with living milk and living frosts, tinged his face with such a blush as roses take on between dawn and daytime. But who can paint the two stars, clear and bright, of his twin brows? Who can portray the lovely scarlet of his sweet lips, rich and full of fiery treasure? What whiteness of ivory or lily can equal his throat, which raises and sustains, like a column of adamant, a heaven of marvels assembled in that lovely countenance? Far from the virile specimen that the name Adonis might invoke today, Marino's paragon of male beauty is still waiting for puberty, with just the first hints of fuzz on his cheek. The description of his long golden hair, white skin, blushing cheeks, ruby lips, clear eyes, and ivory neck could just as easily have been applied to a woman. But here, such traits portray a boy at the age that, quote, feels the spark of love most vigorous and keen. Of course, representations of Adonis and his youthful brethren populate not only the field of literature, literature but also the visual arts. Anibali Karachi's Venus and Adonis shows a young hunter who almost seems the incarnation of Marino's hero with his long golden hair, white body, and beardless feminine face. Similarly, the Christian knight of Domenichino's Rinaldo and Armida could almost be mistaken for the enchantress's handmaiden instead of her lover. Luca Giordano's Diana and Endymion and Giovanni Battista Tiepolo's Rinaldo leaving Armida confirm the persistence of this boyishly effeminate ideal. That ideal is declared, perhaps most explicitly, in a ceiling fresco by Pietro da Cortona in the Pitti Palace in Florence. Here, Minerva carries off a youth from the sumptuous couch of a dismayed Venus and transports him to the waiting arms of Hercules, symbol of masculine strength and virtue. Bearing the inscription, Pallas tears the adolescent away from Venus, the message of the fresco is clear. 
When a boy reaches adolescence, when he becomes fully masculine in the contemporary view, he should leave behind the pleasures of the flesh and strive after heroic deeds and manly virtues. By implication, then, boys may appropriately give themselves over to Venusian pleasures. One is not surprised, then, to discover that the youth here closely resembles the Adonises and Rinaldos of other works. He is only just past the age of love. My central argument is that on the Baroque stage, the castrato represented a theatrical imitation, characteristically exaggerated, of this erotically charged effeminate boy. Just as stage sets might exaggerate an architectural vista or costumes aggrandize Roman armor, so too did the castrato magnify the familiar youth. Support for this assertion comes from many quarters. Physically, of course, a castrato simply retained many of his boyish qualities well into the years of adulthood. Although he might grow in height, sometimes to unusual proportions, he retained the high voice, lack of beard, and soft body of the boy. The few known portraits of castrati also suggest that they retained their boyishly round faces and full cheeks. That this boyish appearance tended to affect the contemporary conception of castrati is suggested by the frequent use of diminutive nicknames for them, such as Nicolino, Senesino, Marianino, and Paoluccio. Further, I have found evidence in Otto Melani's correspondence that he, at least, also sometimes thought of himself in boyish terms. At age 35, for example, he lamented to one of his noble French patrons that he was le plus miserable garçon du monde. A well-known letter of saint evremont from around 1685 emphasizes the connection between boys and castrati in a different way. The letter is addressed to a Monsieur de Rie, a young page serving the Duchess Mazarin, and known for his singing. Saint Evermont's purpose is to convince the boy to submit to castration. I would say to you in an entirely discreet way that you must sweeten yourself by means of a mild operation that will assure the delicacy of your complexion for a long time and the beauty of your voice for your whole life. The money, the red coats, the little horses that you receive are not given to the son of Monsieur Derry because of his nobility. Your face and your voice win them. In three or four years, alas, you will use the, lose the quality of both if you do not have the wisdom to provide for this eventuality, and the source of all these nice things will have dried up. But you fear, you say, to be loved less by the ladies. Be rid of your apprehension. We are no longer living in the age of idiots. The merit that follows the operation is well recognized today, and for every mistress that Monsieur Derry would have in his natural state, the sweetened Monsieur Derry will have a hundred. Not only does this letter suggest that the operation will make the boy more rather than less attractive to women, but it also highlights the sense of preservation that surrounds the operation. The castrato is indeed viewed as a temporally extended boy. The effect, indeed the purpose of castration, is to preserve the boy's attractions, his face, his beautiful face and voice. Given these various connections between the castrato and boy then, I believe that the castrato regularly played the amorous male lead in 17th and 18th century Italian operas, at least in part because his special sexual status, his suspension between the poles of masculinity and femininity, was found alluring and wholly appropriate to men in love. As extravagant embodiments of enticing youth and presumed apostles of sensuality, the castrati could bring a special thrill to portrayals of young men swayed by love. It was an age that valued artifice. The far-flung conceits of Marinistic poetry, the fantastic opulence of Jesuit church style, the extravagant rituals of court existence. Even in landscape design, as historian Franco Valsecchi writes, quote, it is artifice which dominates the search for effect Nature is transformed, deformed. The vegetation is choked by art. So too was the natural boy transformed by his deforming surgery into something deemed more compelling than nature's own creations. He represented the spectacular exaggeration of the beardless boy, the idealized lover. Thank you.
And next up, singer Anthony Barone. Eastman didn't see fit to send us a castrato. They did at least send us an intact singer who was going to sing of war and the delights of war, which illustrates, I think, quite well uh, Roger's point about the spectrum of possible masculinities from the effeminized youth to the fully uh, virile, strong uh, warrior figure. Um, I mean, Roger is a very hard uh, person to follow on the topic of castrati. 
as I say to my students who inevitably want to write about Castrati when they come to see me for office hour, if you haven't read Roger Freitas, go away and then come back when you have and we can have a conversation. Um, so you have to take my remarks in the, the spirit of post rogerness in which they're offered. Um, so I have been working on a new project that deals with the Castrati. It's called The Queer History of the Castrati, uh, or of the Castrato. And um, I did think it was interesting when Alan was reading through the biographies at the, the start that Roger won the, the Philip Brett Prize. I won the Philip Brett Prize. Suzanne, she didn't mention, also won the Philip Brett Prize. So you have here three uh, scholars whose work is very much identified with queer scholarship talking coincidentally about the castrato. And I really don't think that it's that much of a coincidence because for modern readers and for modern opera attendees and modern scholars in general, there is something intrinsically queer about the castrato, about the idea that you would have a singer whose very identity is kind of predicated on an operation that so intimately affects the sexual organs. So the separation of sexuality and musicality is intrinsically kind of twisted up in this figure of the castrato. And I think it's no accident that the castrato seems to be having a kind of prolonged moment. You could look at the Cecilia Bartoli uh, album that came out not that long ago where she sings all repertoire that was sung by Castardi singers and there's a picture in the, the liner notes where there's her head kind of superimposed on the body of a statue which, which has a very kind of masculine chest and then no genitals, just nothing, kind of an absence. So you have this weird kind of mixing in the contemporary imagination of the feminine and the masculine, creating this voice. And this voice is supposed to have, in all of the sources, this amazing power. It's a voice unlike any other voice. It's incredibly sweet or it's incredibly penetrating. And it goes above and beyond what natural singers seem to be capable of. And yet, we don't have that voice. It's gone. It's it's completely lost. There is one Castrati singer who was actually recorded, who's on record, but those recordings don't even answer our need to know what the Castrato voice sounded like. Firstly, they were recorded in 1902 and 1904, uh, and so the recording technology puts a kind of weird distance between us and the way that we can understand this voice. Secondly, it's a voice that a lot of people listen to and feel very disappointed by. It doesn't have everything that these adjectives promise them that the castrato voice is going to have. And maybe it's because he wasn't a particularly good singer. Maybe it's because Alessandro Moreschi was in his 40s when the recordings happened. Maybe it's that he sings with a kind of romantic uh, singing technique that distances his sound from us. Whatever it is, these one recordings don't answer that need to explain it. And fair enough, they shouldn't, because if, if you can imagine never having heard a woman sing, if you heard a single female singer and then tried to extrapolate out all of the ways in which the female voice could sound, even the trained female voice, where would you be? What singer would you pick? Would it be Cecilia Bartoli? Would it be uh, Maria Callas? You know, whoever you pick, you would have a very different idea of what the female voice would sound like. It would ne never give you an idea of what the female voice was capable of. So I'm going to read you um, some excerpts from the, the work that I've been working on. And really, the point that I'm interested in is not necessarily, not necessarily the castrato as he actually was, but more the castrato in the way that we can approach him and what can he mean for us as consumers of this opera, as uh, people in the modern world for whom uh, questions of identity and sexuality and uh, musicality have, uh, have a resonance that, that maybe we can find uh, models to understand where we are in the 17th century. So, 
uh, in the opening pages of his Life and Times account of Vatican Castrato Alessandro Moreschi, Nicholas Clapton writes that the theme of sexual ambiguity is one to which I shall return, as have, he adds, all writers about Castrati. Clapton's casual generalization, more perceptive than his eventual exegesis, crystallizes a crucial dimension of modern Castrato reception. The Castrato's altered body insists on the materiality and sexuality of musical sound. The surgical means of production and the sexualized site of physical intervention focus scholarly attention on the body of the performer and on the reactions of audience members to a voice and body that fall outside the framework of heteronormative desire. My point here is not that Castrati as a group should be considered gay. Bodily morphology maps awkwardly onto sexual identity and anecdotal and documentary evidence testifies to a rich spectrum of sexual behaviors. Crucially, however, prepubescent castration, as is necessary to preserve the castrato voice, interrupts the typical patterns of sexual development, and therein lies the rub. Western culture has long glossed homosexuality as an interrupted or failed instance of heterosexuality, and by that logic, the castrato is always gay, even when he's not. Over the last 30 years, a cottage industry of scholarship has emerged around the figure of the castrato, nurtured by the material and critical desires of the new musicology, by a burgeoning interest in historically informed performance, and by an increased overlap between music and other disciplinary fields such as literary criticism and the history of medicine. As Clapton intimates, much of the literature is hung upon the hook of the castrato's ambiguous sexuality. Here the attentive reader might pause the Clapton's choice of words betrays an interesting slippage. There is not necessarily anything ambiguous about the sexuality of a castrated male body. While the gendered presentation with some castrati was arguably feminine, or in Roger's terms, effeminate, the inclusion of sexual identity within the zone of ambiguity depends on a mechanical conflation of cross-gendered behavior with deviant sexuality. All sissies are gay, all tomboys grow up to be lesbian. Yet, as modern readers, we would do well to recall Eve Kosofsky Sedwick's lucid and compelling admonition in the axiomatic introduction to epistemology of the closet. Our by now unquestioned reading, she writes, of the phrase sexual orientation to mean gender of object choice is at the very least damagingly skewed by the specificity of its historical placement. It has become a queer theoretical commonplace to date the advent of homosexuality and thus heterosexuality to the late 19th century and yet it remains terribly difficult to frame discussions of earlier historical periods without reinscribing the binary axes of the modern sexual matrix. Now, it's important to note that the term castrado has a very specific historical and uh, contextual designation. It doesn't refer to all castrated men. It refers to a specific period of time, a specific uh, location, uh, predominantly Italy, but definitely European, and to a, uh, an identity that was as much musical as it was anything else. When we use the term castrato or castrati, we're talking about men who were castrated prepubescently in order to preserve their voice, not just everyone who was castrated, and not even just everyone who was castrated during this time period in Europe. And uh, the work of Giuseppe Gerbino, who's here tonight, has uh, kind of outlined the extent to which castration was to an extent already normalized in Italy even before it became popular to, to favor the castrato as a vocal solution to the problem of high polyphony in churches, or uh, which is sort of where it first emerged, or the operatic stage and the personification of the adolescent boy slash lover feature. Um, what I'm uh, interested in, though, is, is this modern response. So for many modern readers, the body of the castrato is defined by lack, his history fully coextensive with the disruptive violence of the cut. Displaced by synecdoche, the castrated individual is rendered neither male nor female, but a monster without access to full personhood, condemned to a melancholy existence and continually longing for a prelapsarian plenitude of love and sexual satisfaction. This figure is exemplified in the work of Roland Barthes, 
whose S slash Z, a reading of the Balzac story Saracin, has served as a critical theoretical gateway to the castrato for many commentators. First published in French in 1970 and translated into English only four years later, S. Z. theorizes a castrato divorced from history, thoroughly situated in a post-Freudian imaginary where the act of castration is loaded with developmental significance. For Barthes and for Lacanians like Michel Poizat, castration separates sexual potency from the body. In the case of castrati singers, the agency and aggressive eroticism typically associated with the male sexual organ is displaced onto the singer's voice. This voice as phallus functions as a consolation prize, meted out in the absence of normal sexual development and as a powerful tool of seduction, explaining the popularity of the castrato's song. Um, there are, of course, I mean, th this work by Poizat and by, um, by Bart in particular has become kind of the foundational ground on which a lot of contemporary scholarship on the castrato is written. There are uh, really important exceptions, Roger Freitas is one, Giuseppe Gerbino, Martha Fellman, um, people who are stepping away from this kind of notion of the, uh, the Freudian kind of model, but it has dominated the, um, the existing literature. Um, in Fellman's work, she takes a really interesting approach to the extant recordings, for example. She listens to Alessandro Moreschi's Ave Maria in conjunction with a bunch of different Ave Marias recorded by female singers during the same period, and is therefore able to kind of pull out the ways in which his voice might have been different from a female singer despite the limitations of the technology. But she's still emphasizing the fact that we're never gonna know what these voices sound like. And in fact, she quotes um, a really interesting description by a Hungarian musicologist, Paul Henry Lang, who wrote on Castrati um, and wrote against them. He was one of the people that said we should definitely transpose the voices down. We can't appreciate these operas if we don't have the sexual tension of the male character and the female character. And if it's all just reduced to soprano singing together or women in, in drag, then, it, then we're not gonna understand the, the, these operas the way they're meant to be. So she reads this description and I, I wanna read it for you. About 1612, Lang writes, I heard two castrados soprano and alto, who toured Europe with the Sistine Chapel Choir. They were billed as victims of accident, an old subterfuge ever since the 17th century, but there they were, middle-aged and no longer at the peak of their power, relics from another age. Though I was young, just about the age when Castrato would have had his accident, I vividly remember their voices because of the shock of hearing grown men sing in the stratosphere. Their voices were white, clear and powerful, and had absolutely no resemblance to a woman's voice. And this, in his argument, helps to support his point that substituting women won't work. Um, but as Feldman's research makes evident, the soloist concerned, Alessandro Gabrielli, a soprano, Luigi Gentile, and alto, were not actually castrati, they were falsettists, though they had trained in the same kind of vocal idiom that Moreschi deployed. None of the publicity material that she was able to locate suggests that the men concerned were castrated. No mention was made of an accident. On the contrary, a rare recording procured during the research was traced back to the son of the alto soloist, so presumably he was, in fact, intact because he produced a son. Um, that Lang remembered the story the way he did is not surprising, nor do I wish to suggest that he intentionally misled his readers. Rather, his narrative is irredeemably modern. The focus is on the narrator, his youth, and his vulnerable, though happily intact, sexual organs. The castrati are victims, relics from another less civilized age. The assumptions that twist the narrative furthest from the historical evidence are the details that render the story most convincing. The implied violence assumed to lie behind the high male voice. The forceful, obliterating adjectives used to describe a sound heard only once, many years earlier, white, clean, powerful and the perilous ease with which the voice affects the listener, threatening his own manhood, shocking him. It is the persistence of such rhetoric that makes an historically appropriate reassessment of castrati queerness important. For the same set of vocal, sexual, psychological assumptions in fake Barthes, Balzac analysis, Poizade's Roussons, and Lang's curious anecdotes. Um, so I think Roger's work does a really beautiful, beautiful job 
of explaining why these assumptions that, that are circulating and still continue to circulate, we saw them in the film Farinelli, when Farinelli, of course, is desperate to have a child and his brother, who is intact, can step in and play that role for him. Uh, we see them in... Um, certainly in my undergraduate classrooms when students have a lot of burning questions about Castrati that they really want to have answered. Um, but I think that uh, Roger's work actually points us even further, because if we can imagine an Italy or, or a social context in which castration is normalized, Singers have a lot of older singers that they can look up to, whose careers they might want to emulate, but also who have access to a, this preserved boyhood. This is an identity that would have been familiar, that would have been common. Then and we can see the castrato figure as desired. Then we can imagine the castrato figure as being desired from the perspective of some of the children. I'm not saying that all of the children who became castrati wanted to become castrati or that the situation is not ripe for abuse. Obviously, a child cannot give legal consent to an operation uh, that is going to have permanent ramifications. But there must have been some castrati for whom the identity that they ended up with was one that had been actively desired and one that they were perfectly happy uh, inhabiting. So from the perspective of the castrato, as actively desired by others, and actively desiring the physical and psychological benefits of his altered bodily state, it becomes possible, even necessary, to reconsider the castrato as queer. Moving beyond the titillating complexity of the castrato's ambiguous sexuality, the conception of castration as a viable, desirable identity adduces a number of correlations with modern queer communities. On the one hand, there is a discomforting rhetorical parallel between legislative discussion on the validity of marriage for castrati and contemporary arguments around gay marriage. On the other, the temporality of the castrato's preserved boyhood resonates with extended queer adolescence as celebrated by Judith Jack Halberstam and other queer scholars. For Halberstam, in In a Queer Time and Place, the youth of queer communities is grounded in a decoupling of erotic behavior from procreation and an extended investment in social and musical communities. As increasing numbers of trans people are making public and political declarations of their identities and rights, often at very young ages, the castrati provide an intriguing historical precedence for intervention into the natural hormonal changes of puberty. They also stand as a category of identity intimately linked to biological sex, yet independent of the gender of sexual object choice. Furthermore, the castrati were linked by an essential musicality. The identity category defines a cast of singers, a subcategory of castrated men, not castrated men in general. Arguably, the vocal and musical identity politics of castrati make them more rather than less queer. What if, asked Wayne Kirstenbaum in 1991, voice were, finally, a more useful rubric than sexuality? For some of us, noted Suzanne G. Cusick, it might be that the most intense and important way we express or enact identity through the circulation of physical pleasure is in musical activity, and that our sexual identity might be musician more than it is lesbian, gay, or straight. If music isn't, music isn't sexuality, she argued, for most of us, it's psychically right next door. Now, Italianists frequently use the word mellophile to describe the patrons of castrati singers. In this context, the word is tied specifically to the melody-dominated genre of 17th and 18th century opera. It designates the central role of vocal music and thus by association the expression of emotions and the virtuosic, tonally focused musical content of the da capo aria, such as the arias we have heard. This was a repertory almost exclusively centered on the experience of love. Yet the term mellophile is used to imply a musical love that transgresses reason to describe patrons who spent more money on operatic and chamber singing than can be easily explained by references to appearances or prestige to indicate those who lingered longer in musical pastimes than they ideally should have, stealing time from business concerns and familial obligations. The mellophile thus participates in the excessive love epitomized by castrati heroes, seduced by sensuality, overpowered, perhaps effeminized, easily connected by contemporary critics with degeneracy and moral approbation. The castrato who chooses or embraces his potential for virtuosic song privileges a mellophile economy over the market of heterosexual exchange, occupying a physical and musical nexus of sex, love, and song. 
He also perhaps stood as a model in his struggle between love and the uh, obligations of the adult male that are foregrounded on stage over and over again. So the Castrati has, I would argue, a relationship to an identity that is sexual, but also musical. And it's in this separation from the binary economy of our modern sexual fantasy that we can use the castrato as a way of rethinking our current moment. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce Paulina Sviacek, who will sing for us Non Patra Dirmi in Grata. Thank you. Also from Handels Orlando. Oh, 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 oh,
my goodness, this is an impressive evening and an extremely hard. Um, is it on? Yeah, it is okay, on. Okay, sorry. Ex sorry. E even closer, <laughs> even more intimate. No. <laughs> One of the things, of course, that that I want to bring to the conversation and ask um, anyone to talk about is the intimacy of these voices. Um, or the lack of intimacy. Um, that is, many of these voices were, um, many of the, the singers who we're talking about had extremely public careers um, in theaters that were really quite large, quite a bit larger than this one. Um, so there was not really a sense of vocal intimacy. And yet, one question I want to ask you to respond to uh, is the pun in recitar cantando, recitar acting, cantando singing, um, but cantare in, in uh, carnivalesque slang yeah. means to have sex. And this is on my mind because I'm teaching a seminar on Handel's Giulio Cesare in which there's an aria where Cesare, who, is, who was composed for the Castrato Serezino, sings about how he wants to sing immediately after being seduced by Cleopatra. Uh, and there's a violin obligato that's, that's really quite spectacular. So is there, was there some kind of large-scale cultural pun on the cantare that one could and couldn't do? Mm. That's an interesting question. Certainly, I've seen that that same pun used in in uh, satiric poetry directed at Castrati. So that's the, that was around. Uh, mm -hmm. People knew about it, and I could I could certainly see that happening. I will say just uh, on the other thing that you said about the size of voices and the intimacy. I think it really varied. I mean, just as it would today among mm. singers, because certainly there were quite a few Castrati, especially in the 17th century, who didn't have what you'd call public careers, but were more courtly singers, and they did most of their singing in a chamber setting. Um, the one that I studied, Alta Melani, writes at one place, you know, they, they heard me in church one day, and they all thought they weren't going to be able to hear me because I'm known for, you know, chamber singing and not opera, but of course I showed them. I was, you know, <laughs> plenty loud for that. So um, right. there was, I think, a variety of possibilities there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I think on that note too, even the people that had public careers were often supported by patrons who would have had private access to this very public voice. And that there was probably something about that enjoyment of such a, a well-known public figure in the privacy of one's own home with the invited guests that gave it a sort of extra kind of frisson, like the, the, the ability to hear that voice on demand that other people didn't have. Right, and I think in many cases it was more than frisson. It was, <laughs> I've got him here. <laughs> well, right, and I was actually thinking about the title of, of the evening that's, uh. that combines monsters and superstars in some way, and I was thinking if we, if we one way of thinking about Castrati is, is as a, uh, an eventually large-scale um, cultural phenomenon related to the collection of curiosities of nature that was so important to early modern uh, mm -hmm. Italian court culture at least. Everyone had their dwarves, everyone had their their uh, strange animals. Um, and I know some patrons in 17th century Italy had their pet castrati. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. As they had their pet women singers. Mm -hmm. Right. And they had multiple uses. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, they did, and you've yes. written very nicely about those multiple uses, as, as have some other people. Yeah. Um, but, but another thing I was thinking, well, no, I mean, go on. Do we want yeah, me to please. respond? I mean, okay, so the like, kind of chamber of curiosities idea of the 17th century was very real. The idea that you could just collect up these oddities and then you could go and look at your fetus of the dog with two heads that was discovered and you could show it off and people would be interested in seeing this kind of weird marvel of nature and the way that dwarves really f slotted straight into that category without any real sense of their humanity or the objectifying nature of being kept at court as a pet dwarf. Um, I think that there's definitely a way in which castration as uh, an act that is 
regularly performed on human beings is part of that same kind of um, casual violence that was part of the culture. But I also think that one of the really important things to emerge out of the scholarship of the last 30 years on the castrato is the extent to which people have tried to remove it from the category of a freak. So by today's standards, it's freakish. Everything about it is freakish. But by those standards, it wasn't. And you know, I saw an ad on the subway just the other day about how you should get your dog fixed because it's healthier for the dog and the dog won't have the same uh, you know, exposure to diseases. And they say the same things about, um, in, like even today they say the same things about intersex children who are born, for example, with undescended uh, testes or they have an extra set of ovaries as well. The, the common medical uh, advice is, well, you know, if we cut these out, like, you know, if the child has an extra set of ovaries as well as testes and the full masculine comportment of everything on the outside, well, if we get rid of the ovaries, they won't have ovarian cancer. And it's sort of taken as a very serious thing, whereas you never would say that about a girl. Well, why not? Why? <laughs> if we get rid of her ovaries now, she won't have ovarian cancer. It's kind of like saying of like some eight-year-old, like some brand new baby boy, well, if we get rid of his testicles, he won't have testicular cancer, and won't that be wonderful? Um, <laughs> we've reduced that risk. Um, I, I think that, that what has shifted is who fits into the category of the protected human and who is not. But the fact that that category wasn't necessarily open to everyone, um, I don't think is like contributed to a kind of freakishness, I guess. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, although it, isn't it true, I, uh, I'm actually a scholar of women, not of, of men. <laughs> uh, so, so I don't know if this is really true. Is it true that by and large the, the castrati came from relatively impoverished families whose families aspired to better their economic circumstances? Um, that was the story, that's the story that's always been told. Yeah. And especially there, there are cases that are certainly uh, documentable, documented of that happening, especially uh -huh. in the 18th century. But I would say two things to that. First, all families were trying to improve their their position. I mean, it was a constant battle to, you know, move up to the next rung of society, whatever it was. And um, certainly in my work and the castrata that I looked at so closely, Atta Melani, his family was in the upper bourgeoisie, at least, to begin with, just a, a notch below the nobility. Mm. And um, there was nothing to be gained financially or certainly in terms of uh, prestige by doing this to four of their seven sons. Um, so it, there's, uh, there's other forces at work in, in this question, and that's one of the things I talk about. One of the issues is that in their particular city, it was not so unusual for the, the, many of the young men to be uh, castrated, including uh, a young man of an actual noble family. One of the leading families of Pistoia was a castrato and was, a, was very well known, was a huge philanthropist in the city and was a great civic leader and so forth. So here was this model um, in society and his family I'm sure was thinking um, this you know is a great it's a gift to the church because um, obviously they're going to be church singers that's why you castrate them in, in their youth you don't even think about opera um, and you you know you make this gift and uh, it's not such a bad thing um, and I think that's the way certainly the, the guy I studied Alto Melani lived his life as a as you know yes I'm castrated the, the, the problem was more that he was a singer um, that was the problem. I mean, that he was doing this, this, you know, this work for money that that kept him from moving up into the nobility, and it's why, at a certain point in his career, he stopped singing, and tries to pretend that he's not, uh, that he wasn't a singer ever in a way, uh, even though he's a castrato. It's a very strange thing. But anyway, yeah. Mm. Well, actually, I'm glad that you brought that up about the family strategy because it was one of the things I was really thinking about thinking about this evening, um, in part because the work of historians of nuns, when put together with the work of historians like Giuseppe Gerbino about the early, earliest years of, of widespread castrati as singers, um, points out that the, the rise of both the castrato as a star kind of singer and the nun as a star kind of singer coincides 
uh, with a historical development in family strategy and wealth strategy in Italy, in which in order to, to concentrate a family's patrimony in, in the line, only the firstborn son was allowed to marry and reproduce legitimate issue, and only the most marriageable of the daughters was allowed to marry, and the rest, something else had to be done with them. And what was done with the women, this is the great age of forced monication, or, or it's sometimes called warehousing of women in convents. Um, but many of those women eventually had what they understood to be religious vocations. However, they were cloistered superstars who were known outside the communities in which they lived almost exclusively by the sounds of their voices singing from the, the cloister into the church that adjoined their cloister. And, and they were tourist attractions. At the same time that castrati were public tourist attractions in opera houses. And, and over the same 200 years. So the, the one implication of putting these, these histories together is actually that, that one thing we hear when we hear the Baroque and early 18th century um, craving and fetishizing of the mezzo-soprano and the soprano voice is we hear the sexual self-sacrifice of the, the gentry. Right. And we actually hear the sexual economy of this world um, in the music. And then, and then famous composers like Handel are composing for it, only of course, Handel was composing for these voices in a different place, in London, um, which had a quite different economy, sexually and otherwise. And, and therefore, his singers, um, Senesino among them, um, had an always fraught reception with London audiences. And when I say always fraught, I mean to this day. Uh, earlier today, I watched part of a BBC special on Castrati. Um, that that combines horror and fascination at this weird Italian thing. <laughs> and all, all the musical examples are Handel, and they were all composed for the Royal Academy of Music. They're almost <laughs> all from Julius Caesar, in fact. Excellent. Um, but but um, I, I say all that actually as a way to sort of segue to the notion of the star. Um, Okay, before we get on to the notion of the star, maybe I, I could say something about that because I think that's a really, um, I really f thought it was a pertinent how you linked these, these uh, cloistered nuns and these castrati singers and said that you're sort of hearing the sexual economy. It's also true that if uh, authorized uh, marriage, sexual interaction, children is available only to certain people, then it becomes an even more desired object of fantasy. Maybe, right? Like mm. if, if only mm. the eldest son is going to get married, only he is going to have this kind of spectacular love sanctified by um, the entire community in the sort of legitimate ceremony and the production of children, um, then everybody else in the familial structure is always having to defer that to somebody else, regardless of how many love affairs they actually have uh, or how many children they actually have. Um, so this kind of very public acknowledgement of your love that happens on the operatic stage and in um, marriage, whether the marriage is loveless or not, there's always the kind of fiction mm -hmm. that love will grow even if it wasn't there originally. Mm. Um, then that, that could kind of invest even more desire in, in the love. Sure, sure. I think well, the one other little element that I'd throw in is, I mean, we talk about castrati, we talk about nuns, but then of course there were the women that were performing on stage, right. of which of course you've right. written a lot about. Um, and of course they're, they're also sexually compromised in some way because they're, they either were uh, courtesans, or were kind of assumed. Everyone figured they were courtesans anyway. Um, so they, a woman couldn't just come out on stage and sing and be uh, 
a, a good woman. I mean, that, that's, I mean, she might as well have taken her clothes off for standing out there in front of everyone and letting all these men look at her that way. So it, it was sort of assumed that there was a, the only <laughs> line I know from, from um, Otto's correspondence, he was writing about singers um, that were in Rome at the time, and he says this one woman says, she, she claims to be um, an honorable woman, and I, I figure she probably is because she's so ugly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which just shows exactly the sort of the mindset of of what was going on. So talking about hearing sexual economy, it's it's through all sort of all of the lines of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, but so I did want to talk about stars a little bit because another thing I did this morning was was just cruise the internet to find out what was on the there about Castrati, and over and over again the first line that anyone had to say in any Talking Heads kind of YouTube was these were the superstars of the 17th and 18th century. And not a single person actually thought about the concept of the star beyond using the word. Um, and, and I'm curious, as a person who also has taught some film studies, um, I know Richard Dyer's concept of the star that's applied to film stars, which is that the star is a whole apparatus. It is not just this person, but it is the publicity around this person. It's the, it's the fiction that is the persona, um, as well as the fiction that, that the persona um, performs on stage. But Dyer's most important point about film stars in the 20th century is that their function for us is to stage and in some way, in a fantastical way, resolve the, the essential contradictions of their generation. Um, so Fred Astaire staged and resolved over and over again for Americans in the 1930s, the incredibly gifted man who couldn't find work until he found Ginger Rogers. <laughs> and then he found work and sex, translated into dance. Um, do you have any thoughts of like what are the contradictions that that Castrati, as figures of 17th and 18th century Italy, or as revived figures today, what contradictions are they staging and resolving for us? Emily, you almost answered that in your paper, I think. Yeah, and I think that maybe Roger kind of answered part of that. He, I think Roger really showed what the Castrati were showing and resolving for, uh, like, who they represented, these, like, adolescent love figures, somebody who actually got to stay in and inhabit that moment forever, which was uh, impossible for your average intact uh, man. Um, and I certainly think that right now, they are an object of fascination because of their association with queer identity. This idea that you have a quote unquote woman's voice in a man's body is absolutely linked to kind of degraded notions of the homosexual as a, so somehow both a failed man and a failed woman, the sort of quintessential gay identity. And I think that the way that people are reclaiming that and thinking through it, you can think of like Anthony and the Johnsons, mm -hmm. um, the various uh, countertenants who have to negotiate their public opinion and how they talk about themselves in interviews. Um, they, uh, the two, those are two very different approaches to it because uh, clearly Antony is like very much embracing of, of a, a femininity and a sort of transsexual um, aesthetic, for want of a better word. Um, I guess where I would like to uh, respond to your question is actually to point out the way in which I think the 17th century star system maybe fails to operate under a Dyer's kind of star system. Because the way Dyer talks about the star, what is most valued and precious in the star is the way in which she, and it's almost always a she, performs as if she's expressing her true self. So the star is valued not because she's a consummate actor, but because somehow 
in the portrayal of the character she's portraying, she reveals to you the agony of her actual life and that the audience looks at that agony and responds to it and feels both pity for that person but also sees in them a model for how to deal with their own agonies and their own distresses. And I don't necessarily think, maybe you think otherwise, that that is an adequate model for understanding early modern subjectivity. For me, that's a very Freudian, postmodern. Um, right. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, my sense, and there's not tons of evidence about this, of course, but my sense is that when people saw operas in the 17th and 18th centuries, they were very well aware that they were looking at star singers. There was no confusion about, I'm, um, you know, confusing someone with a role. Oh, that's Cleopatra. No, it's not. It's it's whoever was singing that part, or you know, that's Julius Caesar. It's Cenizino. That's who we're here to see. And the singers didn't really work very hard usually to maintain any kind of characterization. There's you know stories about walking around, talking to people, and then it was time oh. taking snuff, and then it was time for their aria, and they you know sang their aria, and they walked off stage, and then you know it was a good time. Um, so it's not quite the same uh, mentality. And I also I'm not sure that the that there was the sense of uh, you know there being a press for somebody a sense of the reputation and so forth quite the same way as there is say after um, you know P.T. Barnum sets up uh, Jenny Lind or someone coming to the U.S. that's sort of the beginning in some ways for at least for singers of a huge press a hu that sort of precedes the person and then you you know you actually go because you're this person's so famous you've got to see her not because you know anything about her singing or you actually like music or anything. Um, that to me is more like a star in that in that definition. Mm. Um, whereas these singers, um, they be, they you know certainly had big reputations. Some of them, some of them, like the guy I studied, didn't want to be associated with the public at all because that was lower class. But um, there are a lot of different ways yeah. of negotiating but that. But Cenizino, for instance, did have a publicity machine sure, that totally preceded great. him to yeah. London, yeah. Um, yeah. and that was yeah. part of sell true. actually selling the true. subscriptions to the Royal Academy true. on the promise that true, he true. would eventually come. Should we take questions? We should take we questions, and that's exactly what I was going to do next. Any question? I have a question for all three mm -hmm. of you, and it's in regard to Giulio uh, Cesare, <coughs> that is now being performed at the Metropolitan. Yes, it is, yes. Yeah. When I went to see the first time in a previous production, um, I found very interesting, of course, that the role of Giulio Cesare was written for a castrato alto, I understand. And coming from a regular Italian school upbringing, it made perfect sense because if there is a character that is surrounded by rumors and the only rumors of sexual ambiguity is Julius Caesar from the contemporary mm. chronicles of the Roman times up to that uh, that calls him uh, that refers that his soldiers greeted him as Queen of Bithynia before the love affair that he had with the, with the King of Bithynia. Mm. And then I, I, I went to see the opera, and there is, at least I couldn't see any reference at all to any form of sexual ambiguity, we could call it bisexuality to use a contemporary norm. And still, you know, it's the elephant in the room is that this super macho general is played uh, by a castrato. And yet there is no reference to uh, all these things that were more than rumor and that were really part of uh, mainstream culture, it was like common you know, that uh, Caesar had that lifestyle. Well, I don't. I think that that's a great comment, mm. actually, uh, more than it is a question. Um, but but what I want to respond to that is that I I think Caesar um, was never effeminate in those relationships that he had with other people. Was he? Well, yes. He was. He was the, he was the younger junior partner. I, as you know, in, in, yeah. in Roman times, uh, there was not a social or juridical stigma against homosexuality per well, se, right, yeah. but against the, the role that the man assumed. Right. The, right. And the fact that the soldiers called him Regina. Ah. Regina Bitinia, and, and, and in several mm. other instances, for example, there was a sort of a, of a refrain that said, and here comes Caesar who subjugated Bithynia, and here comes the king of Bithynia who subjugated Caesar. So it's very obvious yeah. the reference to the actual 
sexual role that Caesar yeah. had. Mm, that's that's really interesting, yeah. As, as a queen, but in hand of nothing of that. Concern. No. No, and that, that's a whole other uh, yeah. conversation to have about, <laughs> about yeah. handle. There was a. The, uh, bam, you had a question first and then. Do you want me to say? Okay. Well, it's, it's really Giuseppe Gerbino. Yeah. Um, it's the, the best thinking. I mean, that's been a big question for a long time because it suddenly appears mid 16th century in, in Rome in the Sistine Chapel choir. And it's like, well, you know, who got this good idea or crazy idea? Um, but what Giuseppe's pointed out is that, in fact, the operation of castration had been around for a long time, used for all sorts of things all sorts of medical conditions, hernia, uh, lots of different things. This was just the prescribed operation. So there was nothing unusual about the operation right. itself. Ba basically, in a medical economy where you believe that the body is balanced by the humors and right. the fluid in the body, then intervening in the fluid levels can cure ills. So one thing you can do is to let blood out of the person. Another, more drastic perhaps, is, is that since one of the fluids is semen, you can operate on the testicles. So castration was seen as a cure for hernia, epilepsy, gout, a number of other <laughs> issues. So, uh, I mean, unless that actually happens before puberty, it's not going to create the castratic voice. Uh, but certainly there were, there were populations of castrated individuals long before the castrated voice became a kind of fetish object of choirs. Right, exactly. So and where was the music, uh, the medical side of curing these diseases, and then the eureka moment of, gee, this would be great for music? It, it's hard to say exactly. I think it's been mostly associated with Spain for some reason, that it sort of got started there, and then and there documents that, that talk about, you know, what a castrato, whether a castrato should be able to marry, that, that well predate, or I should say, whether a castrated man should be able to marry, that well predate the whole castrato phenomenon in some ways. Um, uh, Giuseppe, I'm, I, I hate to say you know, the wrong thing, and I'm summarizing your work, but um, part of, the, I think, that the instruction there is that, uh, that, he, that perhaps they were slightly um, uh, looked down upon in society, and that a natural path to, to doing something useful, especially if it was prepubertal castration, was to go into music and to begin musical training. And they may have been around longer. It's just it didn't, it, we don't find them in the records in Rome in the Sistine Chapel until mid 16th right. century. And one of the things that is often seen as a kind of catalyst is the Pauline dictum that the woman's voice should not be heard in church. And at the same time, Renaissance polyphony was becoming ever more complicated and ever more expansive. And it, it sort of became common to go from the four voice mass setting to the six voice mass setting. And so the higher voices were more and more in demand. And different countries and different cultures found different solutions to it. In England, the boy soprano tradition remained very strong. In Italy, they continually complained that the boy sopranos were useless. You only got them trained and their voice broke. You had to start all over. Um, and uh, there was a much stronger tradition initially of falsettists, many of which came from Spain. And there's a big question over whether the people who are described as falsettists all were falsettists, or whether some of them were castrati. I mean, they didn't write the kind of records that we as scholars might have wished that they had written. There is no little um, book uh, that has been discovered that lays it all out. But then the, the move into opera is sort of a natural one in a way, because in the, say, the late 16th century, here are all these highly trained singers 
you know, they start as young children at the time of the operation, presumably, or even before. Oh. They continue on with no break in their voice or anything uh, up until their teens. And when people start writing very difficult solo music, monody, um, these are natural people around to, to take a role in that. And in the earliest operas, they usually didn't play lead roles, but as the course of the 17th century went on, they more and more did. Right, and the, I mean, the earliest operas emerged out of a courtly se setting, and, right. and all of the courts had chapel choirs, and all of the chapel choirs by this point had castrati singers. So they were a kind of natural repository of highly trained musicians in the places where this music was evolving. It's, right. it, their kind of entrance into opera is not should not be seen as a surprise. The, the way that they later became kind of the driving force of the opera seria is, is kind of more consequent on their initial success in opera than, than anything else. Right. Yeah, and, it, and in fact it's true that the, the, their voices were considered natural, not artificial. Right. So there was, there was- False, it was false. Right, so there was some kinds of things, particularly control of dynamics, which was considered one way of expressing emotion within a, an individual word that was very highly praised, that only a natural voice could do that effectively, according to the most influential singing teacher of the 17th right. century, Giulio Caccini. Right. And so that meant it had to be either a woman or a castrato who was going to do it for you. Right. If it was going to be in the soprano range or, or, or a treble range. Uh, but I've, I've seen, you have a question? Hmm. And I recall that it was more like comedy. But do you know the movie I'm talking about? I don't. I don't. Right. It was in the 60s. Hmm. Uh -huh. I have to look that one up. It was called Ecostrati, subtitled White Voices. Huh. We should obviously all look it up today. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, sir. Yeah, were any able to spread ambition into composing? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, first of all, just because they had the operation didn't mean they were successful singers afterwards. So that's one of the big problems with the whole thing, <laughs> ethically. Um, although usually they could, they had a job in a in a church choir somewhere, or I mean, they they got by. But um, the ones that became big stars, some of them, especially when we get into the 18th century, when we talk about opera opera stars, yes, they they did all of those musical things, they could become involved in many ways. In the 17th century, when opera wasn't necessarily looked upon as the ultimate goal, when the goal was more about um, improving status, your status of yourself and your family, uh, and performing in public in that way did not really help in that goal. Um, some of them, in fact, not only the one I studied, but there are many, um, at a certain point got out of music altogether and became important figures in court. So ones became historians, they became all sorts of, they took other roles um, and in, in fact became quite important, quite important advisors and so forth. But uh, they considered that a more lofty uh, position in some ways than being a, a singer. So it has to do with social position. Do you know anything about their private sex lives? Is that <laughs> Roger knows a lot about it. <laughs> not really. I mean, there's not <laughs> not a lot. Um, there's certain things. There's a lot of stories that have circulated for years in Angus Harriet's book that are all most of them undocumented. It's sort of like interesting things to read about. But it's clear that a number of them did have sex with men. Um, some of them did have sex with women. Um, what exactly happened is, uh, you know, open to various possibilities. But, um, but yeah, they certainly were involved. What's what's I think is not true, at least in most cases, and what's sometimes been purported is that they were sort of they lost all sexual desire and that they were sort of these neutral figures. I don't think that was ever the case. Mm -hmm. There's not much evidence for that. Francesca. Since the question was brought up of, of how 
how it all started. I was wondering whether you could spend a word or two on how it all ended, uh, because Moreski has been, you know, a room figure of speaking since the beginning of your discussion that Rossini said some 50 years before before this guy came along that it was all over, and he talked about the suppression of the Castrato as as a, as a practice. So I was wondering whether you could spend a couple of words just just saying again, you know, how how is it that does that the Castrato decline and how that reflects a change in the mentality and the mm -hmm. way these individuals were viewed uh, in uh, say late 18th or early 18th century society. Do you want to do it or do you want me to do it? Um, there are two relatively recent pretty good articles, uh, one by Martha Feldman and one by James Q. Davey that look at the twilight of the castrato. And what they share is um, a focus not o on the change in the way that the human and the individual is viewed. So whereas in the 17th century I think it's wrong to use the language of like the sacrifice or the um, the kind of horror that is visited upon these defenseless, innocent children because the idea of a sort of childhood innocence didn't even necessarily exist. Whereas later on, both childhood is being redefined, uh, the individual sense <coughs> of subjectivity is being defined, redefined. We're in a sort of revolutionary world where you can fight for equality and liberty and justice. Um, and <coughs> There's a there's a, like a shift in reception. I think you can yep. look at an increasing number of descriptions of hearing castrati performance where people <coughs> describe the the kind of frisson of horror that they felt at the idea of this 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 person <laughs> who is somehow suspended out of the normal life. Whereas that kind of description of their uh, of the castrato as an individual. It, is, is absent in the 17th century, in Italy at least, even though there were people that <coughs> thought they shouldn't be castrating people in such numbers and that, that it was all in the service of luxury and, and musical uh, indulgence rather mm -hmm. than, you know, a sort of just and proper relationship with right. music. Yeah, I always think of it, you know, as we go into the 18th century and we think of it as the period of the Enlightenment, and when the natural becomes sort of the ideal, once the natural becomes the ideal, the castrato looks more and more problematic. He's really the artificial, uh, a product of a different mentality in some ways. And he hangs on in uh, Italian opresaria, essentially, to the end of the 19th century. But uh, as you can see, as we, she was saying, in the, in the reactions to the castrato, the, the picture really changes as you go through the 18th century. And then, what they always say is when Napoleon comes into Italy, he closes the conservatories and the, the place where they were trained and so forth, and that mostly cuts off the, the only the, sorry, um, <laughs> be very careful. Um, and only in the very super conservative papal states is, does something like that continue on into the dribble into the early 20th century. Yeah, but also I think it, it's another case where you can actually hear a change in the sex gender system because by the 19th century you're getting a sense of, of the separate but equal spheres of men and women rather than an, and a binary gender system that is also a binary sex system. If, going back to what you were, mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. way that you explained the single sex system of, mm -hmm. of early modern Europe. Yeah. And so instead of hearing two equal voices inhabiting a love duet, both sopranos, m male and female, you, you need to hear equal and opposite voices inhabiting a love, du love duet in order for the sound to match the, yeah. the world. The only little thing I'd throw into that is it's very interesting that when they went, when they went away from the, from the castrato as the leading male character, of course, first they went to the, the musico, they call it sometimes, the sort of mezzo roles that you right. see in a lot of Rossini operas, and then they go to the very high tenor. Um, it's right. almost like they want to stay as close to that as possible, and a lot, of, a lot of work has been done on how those early tenor roles were actually sung quite, by our standards, quite lightly, with a lot of head voice. Um, it would have sounded different than you sort of normally hear those roles sung today in, say, um, Rossini and uh, Bellini, Donizetti. And it's only you get toward the end of the 19th century, you start getting these much more heroic, um, we would say more obviously masculine voices. So that it, it drains away slowly, I think, over the course of the 18th century. We could play something. You want to hear, 
do you want to hear? Uh, yes, let's close yeah. with some music. Yeah, let's close. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This will be. <laughs> Okay, so, th so this will be uh, one, of the, one of the tracks that Alessandro Moreschi recorded. This is in uh, 1902. Um, it, you guys may want to say other things before, but I'll, I'll just say maybe one or two things. T to my ear, this is not a representation of anything ha coming from the Baroque period, except that you can hear in his, vo in his voice what a lot of the voice teachers from that period talk about, which is where the registers of his voice are. Um, he sings in his, what is his chest voice, like a boy's chest voice that he has, up to about C above middle C, sort of the tenor high C, he sings up there. And then he, because he's not a very good singer, he has a very obvious change into a head voice, falsetto. I actually think that obvious change was not so derided at that particular point of time as it is now. Like a lot of research no, I, has, I agree. has focused on the idea that having differentiated I agree. It's just he sometimes positive. you'll hear he has problems getting. I mean, right. it, 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 I, Not I agree with he you. Has a break because of the way that because of the way he negotiates it. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, right, and so you can you can sort of hear that aspect of it, and you can also hear I think what you were talking about a little bit. He's definitely trying to sing in a late nineteenth, early twentieth century style. He's trying to sound like Caruso a little bit, and when he sings in his chest voice, you get a little sob, a little, you know, you get a little bit of that when he does that. Um, so yeah, he's definitely of his era, and sounds much more like the singers of his era than than I think we should imagine anything uh, back further. But yeah, so this is this is um, from Rossini's um, Petite Messe Solennelle, the Crucifixus movement. Um, track seven. Hello? They figured we weren't going to ask them anything. Okay, so, so, while, so while they're vamping for that, um, I read today that, that the reason... You did a lot today, Suzanne. I did a lot today. It's been a long day, Emily. Um, but one of the things I read was Sorry. about this recording, that, that the reason we don't hear Oh, 
play uh, we don't need to listen to the whole of this track I, will the sound people will it work from here if I just play no no this is uh, this is unlikely to no well a version of it Th I plugged it into my computer all right yeah we're on so this is a track uh, from an album by a woman called Dana Bates who is a trans musician and she has taken the Ave Maria as recorded by Alessandro Moreschi and effectively created a duet between two voices that are separated uh, over time. And as she says herself, she once was a castrated man um, during the process of her transitional surgery. So uh, just to give a different kind of, uh, that's Rogers like talking about the actual castrati and I was talking about the ways in which we might reimagine them. Here is a, a different take which, which does include that same voice. Until we reach 
Sex is not safe, but can't be withheld. Your size, your stature, your name for yourself is everything right. May I, tonight, across time and shape, against church and state, may we unite.